Eagle Iron Sports, in association with possibly someday your company, proudly presents The Mickle Pod, a podcast show, and so much more. And now, buckle up. Get your pod corn ready. Adjust those deep ends. You have entered the Mickle Pod. Today on the Mickle Pod, on what might be the first of a Mercersburg Academy alumni interview series, as suggested by the person I am talking to today. Yes, I have caught up with John Trichter, old high school friend of mine, current proprietor of Aster Barbershop, Aster Hair Stylist Shop in New York City, the iconic Aster Place. John and I cut it up. We went back in time, a little Mercersburg, caught up through what he's been doing all the way up until now. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, John. Mickle Moore. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. It is great to connect with you, man. Let me tell you what. I am the anti-social media people people. However, there's good in it, and this is part of it. It is awesome to connect with you, my friend. Thank you. I, I couldn't. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I just want to start by saying um, how I remember you in high school. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Because what I thought we would do is start where it started, right there, the hallowed grounds of Mercersburg Academy. Then kind of learn a little more where you went from there, right to where you are now, giving people great haircuts. But yes, let's go back. To where it began and how right. you remember me because i found some nice little things that i remember about you oh that's kind yeah so maybe first some background on mercersburg although you may talk about it on the podcast forgive me for not being a regular listener i promise to listen more <laughs> frequently in the future um but All it's good. uh when we went i mean i think it's fair to say mercersburg was a third tier boarding school with a first tier athletic program right is that fair <laughs> that is absolutely fair But Mercersburg is a great example of an institution that can advance good leadership. I think after we left, they got some really good board members, presidents, and they made a concerted effort to raise a lot of money. And then they used the money well. They didn't just raise the cash, but they deployed it and they moved up the ranks. And I think they are inarguably now not just a second tier boarding school, but top second tier boarding school that competes with the likes of Lawrenceville and probably beats out Lawrenceville in a number of categories, which just seems unimaginable when we Well, I tell you what, that is well put. I don't keep up as much with everything that goes on with the school. Now, what I remember when we were there is, I mean, it was pretty competitive academically, but a lot of changes in, what, 30 years, for sure. Yeah, positive changes. Yeah, no, I agree. That's right. And then athletically, um, uh, this is... Also, undoubtedly the case, although impossible to prove empirically, but it is absolutely true that Mercersburg has by far, by far, the most Olympians of any high school in America. And that, that goes back. has to be true. What was it? 22 when we were there. That was the shirt, the swimmers wore. 22 Olympians. And- yep. And then, of course, that's history of the school in Pennsylvania is rich when it comes to track and field long before our era. Um, but uh, it, Mercersburg is situated in a place in Pennsylvania where there were a lot of um, reservation schools for Native Americans, and a lot of them were superior track athletes. In fact, uh, Jim Thorpe went to a, a reservation boarding school not far from Mercersburg, and it's quite possible, although also impossible to prove, that he may have competed in a meet at Mercersburg at some point. Um, but you had the likes of those competitors, and then after – World War One and World War Two, you had a lot of older um, enlisted men who then went back to high school and at an older age um, ran track and field and uh, participated in the Olympics, and, and they came out of Mercersburg as well. A rich history at the school for sure. And, you know, you and I met 
you were a junior, I was a sophomore. You know, my journey to Mercersburg was due to my father deploying and his career and the fact that the DOD school would have been in London. And my folks were having no part of me running around in London. So they felt that Mercersburg was going to be a good spot. And you were there. And let's start right there. Memories of me. Love to hear it. Yeah. Okay. So my uh, experience of you in Mercersburg is in three acts. I remember you early on as being this very skinny. I mean, you must have weighed 85 pounds fully clothed after you jumped into a pool, right? <laughs> Big mop of kinky hair oh, yeah. and looking to find your own way and a little kind of, you know, nerdy. And that's act one, right? Sounds good. Act two, I remember you found a really good group of funny guys who were tight and creative and definitely like to have fun, a lot of laughter out of the group. And you were very comfortable in that zone, right? In that uh, click that you had um, developed with yourself and uh, some, some other great Mercersburg uh, students. And then I graduated and I came back and I remember seeing you as a senior and it's like, I think you were voted prom king and you were dating the captain of the cheerleader, the, the captain <laughs> of the cheerleading team. I think that's what happened by the time you graduated Mercersburg. I'm pretty sure. You were basically running the place. You were the most popular kid. You acted in the plays. Uh, I think you ran a 4 4 40 and you had straight A's. That's exactly how I remember your third act. That is, I don't know if I could have described it better myself. And, um, <laughs> But you know that's kind of that's kind of how it went, right? You know, as a as a as a sophomore landing at Mercersburg, it was a completely different environment for me. And you do have to find some footing. It made some great connections there, great friends, like you said, and that helps. You know, because you're a 15 year old kid just trying to figure it out. And uh, senior year, I appreciate that. That was a great year. Everything went downhill after that. Right. I mean, there was the <laughs> Roman candle right to high school and then there it went. But here we go, full circle. And I get to talk to you. Yeah. And yeah. I well, if, if it makes you feel any better, I've had lots of failures uh, <laughs> since Mercersburg myself. And I also attribute all of my successes, um, what they are, to uh, all of my many failures. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed of my failures. I'm, I talk about them all the time because they are unbelievably important for anybody, especially entrepreneurs. Um, and I often talk about failure in terms of how Winston Churchill talked about it, right? The Churchillian definition of uh, success um, is the ability to fail every day without any noticeable loss of enthusiasm. That's right. I think you, you can't succeed without, without failure. True success doesn't come without it, right? Michael Jordan, one of my favorite things from Michael Jordan, you know, I've taken hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shots and I've missed, right? I've failed, but I continue to move forward. And it's from that failure where I get success. Yeah, I remember Insane. that uh, Nike campaign. That was pretty <laughs> cool for the Jordan Nike camp. I remember that commercial. Yeah, that was uh, yeah. that was impactful. That's a good one. And you know, back at Mercersburg, I mean, you weren't playing hoops, little baseball. You mentioned um, acting in the plays, Camelot. You were, you were in Stony Batter with me senior year, and um, it's February, and in Mercersburg, that means Urban Marshall Weekend, and we were, we were on Marshall, and that, um, I think, your senior year, my junior year, we finally won, Marshall won. We had, it had been, what, a, a drought worse than the Jets looking for a Super Bowl. You're talking about the literary societies at a yeah. boarding school now. I mean, this is a pretty – no wonder only about two dozen people listen to this thing, Mikkel. We got to broaden the uh, – You brought it up. <laughs> Fair enough. That's what we're doing right now. Fair enough. So um, so what's the subject uh, at hand? You mentioned um, uh, the barber stuff. Would you like me to talk a little bit about that and, and I, how I got into that? Yeah, I would love to hear how you got into that. The places, Astor Place hairstylist, Astor Place barbershop, has been around since 1947, not only a New York institution, an iconic American institution when it comes to barbershops, absolutely tell the story. Now, I pulled this from the website, 
And I'm looking, John, at your senior year picture in the 1988 Carux here. And it mentioned in that little blurb, was it the post? About how you got your first paid at the barbershop back in 1985. And I'm looking at what you're rocking here in that senior picture. It's kind of a, what would we call that? There's yeah, a, a disaster. Maybe a little fade action going there. I'm not sure. I'm it's, not you sure. have to remember, we went to, <laughs> we went to boarding school. I didn't get my hair cut while I was at boarding school at Astor Place, right? I had to go to, right, right. do you remember the barber at Mercersburg, the town? What was her name? No, it was a, I had, went to Butcher Bob. That's what they called it. You went them. to Butcher Bob? Yes. So that was a Butcher Bob. Place. Yeah. Um, that was not, you can't blame that on Astor Place. No. So, so Astor Place uh, is a wonderful story. It's um, uh, a small business started by an immigrant family, an Italian family back in the 40s. Uh, the grandfather came over on a boat, opened up a very small shop in what was then an industrial part of New York City. A lot of manufacturing was kind of on the outskirts of Soho in the smack middle of Greenwich Village slash the East Village, actually on the border there. Uh, you still there? I'm here. You might have gone out a little bit. Hey, Mickle, you still there? I am here. I see you connected, but you might have dropped off a little. Yep, yep. Sorry about that. So let's see. So small business, immigrant family. Um, they had some success and then hit on hard times in the 60s, right? And it was because they were downtown. And um, in the 60s, very few people cut their hair the same at the same rates. Uh, and there are true stories, uh, I've had confirmation of this, that a lot of the NYU students down in downtown New York City would walk by the uh, old Italian barbers um, and, and wave their long hair and laugh uh, at the barbers uh, who had, you know, a, a profession that was, that was on, the, uh, on the wane. Um, and they almost went under. The family almost closed shop. And then something interesting happened. Um, styles changed. Now, um, the barbershop is also located not only near NYU, but what was then CBGB's, which is an iconic uh, music venue in New York City where punk basically started, along with places like Irving Plaza. Uh, and I'm forgetting another downtown punk um, music venue. So uh, what you had is uh, Cooper U Cooper's Union, some NYU kids, the downtown social life that was bubbling up in the 70s that gave us punk and then there were the there was the style and the hair that went with punk which included all of these spiked haircuts and shaved heads and who was better at a uh what they used to call white walls or, or, or now we call you know fades and high fades right, right. than the italians with their shears they were artists right and so yes the downtown community um that was uh, the, the youth went to astor place to get those haircuts and then one day uh, Andy Warhol walked in to Astor Place to see what was going on there and where these interesting haircuts were coming out. And he walked in more or less with part of his entourage, which included the likes of, you know, Keith Haring, Basquiat. Um, and the place blew up. So Astor Place became huge in the 70s uh, through punk. And it was responsible for creating that look that then percolated uptown and throughout the world. Uh, that all really started at Astor Place. Wow. Now then the eighties hit and you had hip hop and you, again, right. you had high fades and you had lines and you had all sorts board. of style. We had a lot of rappers in the eighties. This was really before uh, African-American entrepreneurs proliferated with what we know as the black barbershop throughout, you know, Harlem and other urban areas. And so a lot of the best black barbers <laughs> were at Astor place and all of the uh, New York city rappers <clears throat> were, uh, clients, um, including, you know, other artists, um, uh, African-American artists, but I mean, from Method Man to Run DMC to Q-Tip to Sinbad, um, and folks like that, all regular clients at Astor Place. Uh, and Astor Place was also the first barbershop to really get creative with designs and put, um, interesting, uh, both designs and kind of, um, logos into people's heads. Right. So one day there was, um, uh, when the first Batman movie came out, it was a cultural moment. Uh, Batman kind of blew up and some guy wanted uh, the Batman logo shaved into the back of his head. 
So one of our talented barbers did it. And for whatever reason, there was a, a news crew at Astor Place at the time doing a story on something else, and they caught wind of it. And then the next day, there were three news crews, and it was on the uh, front page of the Daily News. So um, that's part of its history. Uh, and, and it was a beloved New York landmark for, for many of those reasons, uh, and also because it was just typically authentically New York, you know, n- no marketing, uh, a natural, organic uh, phenomenon, uh, a, a bit gruff, you know, there's certainly nothing polished about the place, but very, very reasonable places where celebrities would come with New York working, uh, working class and get the same haircut for the same price with everybody being treated equally. So it had that co-equal ethos that is really endemic and typical of New York. So this was Astor Place. Um, and I would say three generations. I think that's right. It was the grandfather, the son, and that's Enrico. Uh, and then uh, Enrico had two kids, Paul and John. And Paul and John w- were the last generation to run the barbershop, like many immigrant service industry businesses, you know, dry cleaning shops, um, barber shops. The next generation often goes to law school, to uh, business school. They become engineers, doctors, nurses. They don't want the family's business. They grew up there and it's not for them. That's right. what happened after Paul and John Beza um, had run the place into their 60s and thought about retiring. And then at the same time, the pandemic hit, right? And that absolutely crushed, crushed barbershops and barbers and hairstylists really took it hard. Uh, there was a a fund for restaurants, right? A disaster relief fund for restaurants with a couple of billion dollars that was not administered or applied well, but still it existed. Um, where And there, was the P, there were the PPP loans. But barbershops, remember, a lot of barbers and hairstylists rely on tips. So their right. salaries are meager compared to what they're used to living on. And PPP may have been helpful when it came to replenishing what they were reporting on their w, W-4s, uh, but they lost their tips. And so barbers and hairstylists really took the pandemic hard. And of course, people stopped getting their haircuts, so there was no business. So John and Paul decided to close the shop and retire. Um, they, they reopened it after the pandemic for a bit, but couldn't make a go of it. And it was a huge news story. Um, and uh, I've been going there, as you pointed out, since I was 14 or 15. It was the first grown-up haircut I ever got. Uh, I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I left there feeling like an autonomous teenager, you know, like uh, my own style and my own barber. And so, um, right, you had your been, guy. yeah. So the, the big connection to it, I knew John and Paul a little bit and I said, would you sell it to me? And they were, um, uh, they were torn because they wanted it to endure, but it had been in their family for so long. Um, but they did know and like me, um, which helped. They also got some pressure from the landlord. It was the only remaining business in the building since the landlord's family, it was a family owned uh, real estate uh, empire, uh, bought the building. Uh, Jeff Corral's father bought the building uh, prior to the 1940s and Astor Place was there and and, and is still there. So Jeff, who is also a giant of New York, put some pressure on them to sell. And then the mayor at the time, Bill de Blasio, is a regular customer, comes in every um, two weeks. He was an NYU, since he was an NYU student, he's been coming in since then. Wow. He really loved the place. So he called and tried to put pressure on them to sell. And that helped. Uh, but they were pretty much already there. So they um, wound up selling to me for, you know, a number. I think I overpaid for the asset. But it, they needed to save face uh, a little bit. They, they just didn't want to give it away. And I thought that was fair and understandable. And then I needed a smooth, friendly transition because I needed all the media around the the transfer of uh, Astor Place to look like it was on friendly terms, uh, and it right. was. Uh, I didn't want it to be, you know, some vulture came Take in and over. yeah, right. some corporate raider. Like, no, this had to be done because it was for the good of saving forty good paying jobs, middle class jobs for barbers, and for keeping New York going in a very difficult period in its history. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. John and and, and Paul and and I are still on very good terms. They come back and visit. Uh, uh, and I, you know, run the shop now with a team that I put in there. Um, and then I, uh, to buy it, I, I put up some money and I also enlisted the help of some other friends of mine who are successful in New York and have the same affinity and love for a Hester place. So, so we bought it. It is the, um, closest I will ever get to owning Rockefeller center. 
And yeah. it's the best press I'll ever get. I was on the front page of the Daily News, and it yeah. will be the first line in my obituary. <laughs> well, I think it's an amazing story, right? And I mean, they said angel investor was able to swoop in with, as you mentioned, some other folks, some other prominent folks there in New York and, and save an iconic institution. And and you mentioned, how, I mean, who was there just the other day? Um, oh, yeah. Sam Rockwell stopped in. Sam Rockwell um, stopped in. Breaking Bad. Mark uh, Margulis. Hector Salamanca. Salamanca, which was yep. it's just, I mean, and people are, are there all the time. How often are you there? I know you have other responsibilities as well. Yeah, so uh, they do have a nice little office in uh, the side of the barbershop that's very private where I can get a lot of work done. Okay. And, and it's downtown, not far from uh, my other enterprises. So I get down there at least twice a week, uh, two or three times a week. I'm not there the full days, but I'm, I'm there for like a clip of a few hours for at least three days a week. And I'm getting work done. I'm also hanging out with the barbers and the hairstylists, uh, the management team. Uh, the customers, and uh, I do a little social media around it as well, and it's and I get a huge kick out of it. It's it's just it brings me a lot of pleasure. Now, don't get me wrong, the barbers are crazy, uh, so <laughs> it's it's a they labor of love, right. but it's also like the bane of my existence uh, <laughs> some days. But it's um, a lot of fun, and I would say it's given me a very unexpected and probably you know, ill-deserved cachet in New York, right? I could dine out on the fact that I own Astor Place, whereas That's anything okay. and everything else I've done in my life pales in comparison. I could win the Nobel Prize in New York, <laughs> and in New York, they wouldn't give a shit compared no. to the fact that, you know, I happen to own Astor Place. That'd be underneath the byline that says, saved Astor Place on the tombstone. Yeah, and Nobel won the Pulitzer. Prize. Yeah, right. owned saved Astor Place, <laughs> also has a Peabody. That's right. <laughs> and so, you know, also, as much as you might want to talk about it, uh, your school, right? You're doing great things for people, families, and children with special needs. I was on the website. I know that is a true passion of yours. As much as maybe you just want to give a little background about the school, how you're able to help people through great research and the programs there. And then I had a question because a big part of my show we talked about this a little bit. I do a whole segment called Pickle with Mipple. And if the children aren't pickleballing at the school, it's something to think about. It's a great therapeutic activity. And I'd be happy to donate some paddles for the cause to get them to start pickling. But you think about that. But as much as you might want to talk about it, that's okay. Or we can steer right back to talking some Mercersburg stuff. I... I'd love to read you your senior quote. I, rem I wonder if you remember it. I think it was, don't live your life by words, for God only knows the person who said them. You're very close. The actual words are better. And didn't you write it? Didn't you write your own quote? Uh, I think so. Give it to me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Senior year, a young John Trichter. As you look for guidance, don't live your life by words. For God only knows the moron who said them. <laughs> John T. I did have a particular way of adding zest to, <laughs> to right. things back then. Uh, fantastic. That's pretty funny. I didn't remember the pun. Thank you for, for reminding me. Um, so, hey, a lot of good stuff there. That's rich, Mickle. Let me start with the, the pickleball. Uh, I would love to get a few paddles and um, uh, from you and uh, some, uh, some pickleballs. And I'll, I'll do some videos of the kids playing it on social media, make sure that your uh, branded um, equipment gets uh, play on our, on our platforms and channels. But, but thank you, that's a great idea. I'm embarrassed I haven't thought about it before. It's a perfect sport for some of our kiddos. They're gonna love it, thank you. I'm here to help. <laughs> Good, you're a humanitarian in your old age, middle age. <laughs> That's right. I'm, we're still young, John. That's right. So the um, uh, the story of my schools is, uh, I think, instructive, um, in, or at least illustrative of what I've learned and, and done with my life. I had a, a okay career in uh, politics, not great, 
uh, in communications when I was younger. Uh, and I get pulled back into it every once in a while, but, but it's a disease and I, and I try to clean. Um, <laughs> And the uh, and, and and an okay career in finance. Uh, and if you and if you're in finance in New York, New York City and you do okay, you can make a few bucks, right? But I wasn't hitting home runs in finance. I was like a slap hitter, you know, a solid player, uh, and did okay. I wound up in some very good teams. So I was a, a role player in some very good investment banks, and then boutique restructuring uh, firms um, doing some big restructuring, corporate workouts, uh, and a lot of hard work. Uh, After I was a certain age, uh, you burn out, and I'd burned out, and I'd had enough, and you look for something else. You look for something that's sustainable, that's that's meaningful, impactful, um, and that you're passionate about. And this is where I think I failed in my career uh, fundamentally for a very long time. And I wish somebody had told me this when I was younger. The best advice I wish I had gotten, and, and the best advice I give to to, to those looking for career guidance is um, find what you're passionate about and do that. Because uh, you could be okay successful if you're just good at something and kind of like it. Um, but to be great at something and really happy, you need to be passionate about it. Uh, and so I, I figured that out a little bit um, a little bit late in life and then also fell into what my passion is, which is um, the special needs community. Uh, I don't um, like to talk about particulars, but my life has been touched by autism in a personal way. And, right. you know, you love younger kids and then you have your own, and then you love the younger kids that are kind of like your own kid. And um, I, I stumbled into this world of therapies, modern therapies that are tremendously effective for children with autism and ASD. Uh, it's also a very expensive prospect for families um, who are dealing with these kinds of uh, neurological differences. Uh, so mm-hmm. I was paying these uh, fees and, and spending this money on these very passionate and dedicated and effective therapists. And I realized this must be an enterprise. Like there's no way this costs this much money and somebody can't figure out how to build a business around it and then spread the footprint of these therapies that I was so taken with and I thought were so efficacious. So uh, even so, I cast it about for a while trying to figure out an entry point because I knew nothing about this space, um, but uh, learned quickly, drank from the fire hose, and purchased a small therapeutic center day program that had been doing well but then kind of busted, uh, and it busted for the same reason most enterprises, big and small, go bust. uh, And that's because of management, right? So management kind of broke up uh, and the place winnowed and was launching off its laurels for a while. Then it kind of, you know, was about to, was about to go absolutely bankrupt. So I came in and bought out two of the partners. I partnered with the third partner and we reconstituted and relaunched this, this little thing in 2019. And it was nothing. We had no kids. We had no staff. Um, we had some, we had a lease on a space, some licensures and, and a little bit of reputation from what the place used to be. And, and we hung out a shingle more or less that said under new management in September, 2019, we wound up with six students, six kids in an alternative education day program, six beautiful autistic uh, students who needed a place to go to school because their own schools and the public education system had absolutely failed them. Mm-hmm. And then we turned around and the next day we had like 10 and then the next month we had 12 and all of a sudden it took off. I mean, absolutely took off. And the secret was obviously not that I was doing anything. I, I certainly didn't apply therapy or teach anybody, God forbid. Uh, but I spent all of my time recruiting the best, most talented teachers and therapists for artistic kids that I possibly could. And the rest kind of happened because of that. So we opened up another school in Connecticut the next year. Uh, We're going to open up a third and probably a fourth this year. We also have a whole suite of services that we can um, provide to families in their homes. We do therapy in the homes. We do therapy at centers after school. Uh, I've got a uh, special needs transportation business now. I've got minivans that we, the kids are at. You can't call them short buses anymore, but I'm looking no. outside my school and I see, you know, What do you four. got, spinners out there? No, we, we literally have the white, what they used to call short buses and that's yeah, not yeah. politically correct. Sorry, Michael. But yes, uh, no, the you're sprinters, right uh, I actually buy these things. You. Thanks so much. I buy these things and the sprinters are overpriced. Um, yeah. Uh, so I've got what I've got. Yeah. Other things, no sprinters. I, I'd like to get a sprint for myself. I was going to say you need one for the mobile office. Isn't that exactly. the, that's the thing now, right? Exactly. So, uh, so out. I've got these, I've got these schools. Um, I've never been happier. There was a, a time also between corporate restructuring and what I'm doing now, 
uh, where I, I worked a year uh, in venture capital. My wife's family found a lot of success in venture capital, and I joined their their firm for a year and hated it. <laughs> um, uh, and it's interesting because I came from restructuring, so my instinct was to try to restructure all the broken companies they invested in. But that's not the venture capital model, right? The venture capital model right. is you forget about those and you put all your resources into the successful one and you hope for a you know, 50, 100x on, on the successful that's ones. Right. I couldn't do that, yeah. So uh, a, mi- a year of misery in venture capital. Uh, and the one nice thing about it is anytime you were frustrated, the VCs are very good at having these beautiful office spaces with foosball tables and pool tables and you can let off stress. And so my pool game got re- a lot better for the, in the year I was doing VC. Uh, but uh, I s- tell you this because now what I do um, when I work is that if I want to relieve stress or take a break, I walk outside and I play with these beautiful children. Uh, and it's wonderful Nothing and it's so much that. better, so much yeah. better than billiards. Yeah. Well, I remember you were a decent billiard pool player in Ford hall down there at the, uh, at Mercersburg. You had a pretty decent stick game back then. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was like Eddie Feltz. Is that the guy's name from the hustler? Fast Eddie Feltz. Character? Yeah. Eddie Felson or Feltz? Something like that. Yeah. I can't remember. Who was the Tom Cruise guy? I'll be him. Yeah. <laughs> it's, exactly. Because when I think of you, I think of Tom Cruise. <laughs> I think most people do. They just they think Maverick. That's what they think. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, you know. Um, so I've seen pictures on the book face. Speaking of social media, of Mercersburg alums who've been able to drop by Astor Place and sit there and have a stogie with you. Who recently has come by? Did I see a, that was a while back? He had stopped by. Who else have you seen? Or other than the folks we mentioned who uh, recently came by that the people would love to know was at the show. Steve Zimmerman. You remember that guy? <laughs> yeah, I remember the Z-Man. Yeah, just showed up. I don't think he, I can't remember if it was even announced or not. He just walked by and said, director. <laughs> Hadn't seen him for 35 years or whatever. Oh, wow. That, that is great. And like I told you, I ran into Chris Kelleher and Andrew Sonia a year ahead of you, two years ahead of me. And I thought that was fantastic. We all sat down and had dinner. Amy Burbank was there, and Amy Kelly are now. And um, it, it's it's wild when you can reconnect and catch up with some folks. I was just actually texting with Sam Hopple and Aww. mentioned uh, you and I were going to speak uh, on my show here. And Sam's doing well. He's there in Pennsylvania. That's nice. Sam is uh, one more. Pia Catan uh, also is a frequent. uh, Yeah, we do women too. We have women hairstylists and Pia has a hairstylist now there that she goes to. I was going to mention that I saw on the the website, you know, a fleet of your our barbers or what now do you you call a female barber a hairstylist or a barberette? Is there an official term? Yeah, we call them hairstylists or, or okay. stylists. Uh, there, there are a couple of them are really, really focused on women and do blowouts and and all okay. the kind of things that women, you know, will generally get serviced. But there are a couple of women, female uh, hairstylists who were there in Astor Place's heyday and really specialize in, in spikes and fades and do and, and rock. You know, they're like rock stars. They, I like that. Yeah, and and they they are just about a about the same skill set and the same clientele as as a, as a male barber. Um, but sorry to jump around. So Sam Hopple. So uh, I'm very uh, pleased to hear you're in touch with him. I follow him a bit on media. Sam um, uh, Sam was a really interesting high school athlete because oh, yeah. he was a very, very good high school quarterback. Yes. And he's like, and he had some really amazing skills as a high school quarterback. He also had relatively, I mean, he was fine in high school, but relatively slow feet and a slow release of the, of the football, right? Probably what he would have needed to be a D1 recruit uh, at a high school. But yeah. he had an amazing arm and accuracy, and he threw one of the best balls I've ever seen. He would throw these spirals that looked unnaturally tight. Like I'd never seen a football travel through the air like that. Um, and between five to ten to fifteen yards, I've never seen a more accurate quarterback. Yeah, he had the he had the ten fifteen yard out uh, down. You know, back then they would have said, or today they would have said back then he could spin it right. It was tight. Yeah, and the coach was a pretty innovative coach. I mean, he was ahead of his time. There weren't many spread offenses back then in high school, or even in college. He had a spread offense with a lot of timing pass patterns. Um, and Sam was under that coach, Coach Muriello, 
was very right. very successful quarterback for for his junior and uh, senior year. It was it was wonderful. I loved watching him throw. I preferred Mrs. Mariello and Pretzel Pie, Coach <laughs> Frank, and doing sprints. So, but I didn't play yeah. football. Yeah. Um, so, what else can I tell you, or, or can I ask you a little bit about you know yourself, or is that too repetitive for your listeners? No, no, I don't talk about myself at all. We do sports and more. I'd be happy. Go wherever you'd like. Yeah. So, um, uh, on sports, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your connection to pickleball. Uh, you know why this is so important to you, and if if you have any insights also on you know this movement to disrupt tennis. I don't know if you follow this, <laughs> um, but but tennis seems to be uh, a sport that for whatever reason private equity guys are like eyeing for disruption now because yes. they think. Um, I've read about this in the New York Times, which means if I've read about it in the Times, I'm way behind, um, <laughs> right? Because the Times is going to be way behind by the time these things percolate to to legacy <laughs> to the, with, with, yeah. To the people. So what's going on with pickleball and tennis? Like, why is this yeah. so much disruption and innovation and, and why is it so popular, becoming so popular now? I, I think the pickleball wave has, has not beginning – to even crest. And so my journey with pickleball and how I got into it was, you know, I myself, I, I'm in recovery and, you know, that's a story of its own and that's an offline story we can talk about. And I, I've always seen people play in pickleball and I play a lot of golf. I love to play golf. There's pickleball. I always thought it was the old person's game, right? You just see them out there and it's... And then I started to meet some people who were playing pickleball and me and my son went down to this park near my house, Gilbert Regional Park, huge park. They've got tennis courts, let's say, of a Baker's dozen tennis courts, Baker dozen pickleball courts, two separate parts of this park. And the tennis courts, barren, the pickleball courts, packed. And I, and I started playing. And I started, what really got my attention was an article in Sports Illustrated about years ago. And it was about the billionaires warring for the landscape of pickleball. And I had to read it. And I mean, first of all, it's been around forever, started in Washington state. And I think the momentum now is there's these, there's three competing tours. There's a team event. And the thing about tennis is a lot of tennis players are starting to gravitate towards this pickleball movement because it's, it's actually young, it's fresh. People love to play it. And I think, I don't know what happened internally in professional tennis. It's been on a decline for a long time. I think even from afar, a casual sports fan would say that, right? You used to wake up for breakfast at Wimbledon and sometimes you might, but if you tried to name me five top tennis players, unless you're really in the know, and didn't say Federer, Nadal, or a Williams, you'd probably struggle. And if you talk to people now, the way that pickleball is being marketed, and I think the way it will continue to be, um, that's where it is. And so the internal dissension is pickleball is, I, I said tennis is dead. Pickleball is going to replace it. It's going to become an Olympic sport. They've got major TV money behind it this year which is upping professional prize money. So these players can now make, I think, up to six figures playing pickleball this year, and that's only gonna get bigger. And then endorsements, you know how that works for athletes. And then I love to play, I'm not very good. And so as I started this podcast, the Micklepod, always a passion project of mine, uh, people have always said, oh, you should have been in radio. You should have done this. You should have done that. Well, I just never did. My name is Mickle. It was just logical with Mickle. Makes a lot of sense. And, and I love the game. And I just started doing my segment through some fortunate connections. I was able to go and be a live media presence in Las Vegas at this televised pickleball event in December and have been able to continue to have a media credential access of the tournament that's out here in Desert Ridge. If you're local, get out to Desert Ridge, BPA, this weekend. And, and it's a lot of fun. 
And, and what I find, John, I was telling my son this. We were out at the Major League Pickleball event that was out here in Mesa this past weekend. And we, we were leaving, and my older son, Kate, wanting to start playing pickleball more. And a couple of times he said, where the hell are we? What is this? Because this is a legitimate professional sporting event. And I told him, I said, affordability and accessibility. Take advantage of it now, because in three years, it will not look like this. You're not going to be able to just walk up to one of these players and say, hi, what's up? And maybe they sign something for you, talk to you for a minute. Or with a day pass, sit right behind the players and managers and things of that nature. It was incredible. So I think it's it's coming. That's kind of how I got into pickleball, a little bit of how I started the podcast was a little while ago, but I cover all sports and pickleball. A little bit about, you know, my journey into that. I appreciate you asking. Nice. That's fascinating. And so wait, on the subject of sports, and here I'm jumping around again, I know very little bit about sports. You're a hell of a baseball player. Oh, that's nice of you to say. I was, I, yeah, I was a good high school baseball player. I was a very mediocre college baseball player. Um, but I know very little bit about sports. I read uh, as much as the average passing, uh, passive sports enthusiast, and that's it. I will say um, uh, I've watched a little bit of uh, the NFL season this year, and I am struck, and, and I want to hear um, your reaction to, the, to, to my amateurish opinions. Uh, I'm struck by how good the Eagles are. I'm both yes. struck by how good they are and and tragically troubled by how good they are. I agree. It's, it is troubling that the, it, as good as they are, one, because I am, of course, a Washington Redskins football team commanders fan, whatever they're called right now. Though it sounds like new ownership might be able to that ship. The Eagles are scary good, and it's frustrating. I've got a good friend of mine that I went to college with, big Eagles fans. And, you know, I mean, on the one hand, when Philly teams are good, it's good for sports. Similar to New York fans, right? When, when New York sports teams are good, it's good because you got New York fan and Philly fan, let's call them in the outspoken category. They wear it on their sleeves, right? And so it, it's, it's fun for me. And I think, I'll say it, I think, I think the Eagles will probably win the Super Bowl. It's right out here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So now explain to me how the Chiefs started out as one point favorites. Because they're the Chiefs. That's all Patrick Mahomes right there. That's legacy. They're getting some legacy points. They won a Super Bowl a few years ago. And I think people are, they're loving the story, the hurt Mahomes, the broken leg. We'll see. Uh -huh. and, and the smart money went fast to the Eagles when that line came out. So, I mean, again, I think the Vegas guys clearly got it wrong, right? No. Yeah, we'll see. I, in my experience, Vegas seldom gets it wrong so we'll see how it flips around or adjusts fair enough all right maybe i should put some money on the chiefs what do i know i i wouldn't tell you where to go with that i think it's going to be a great game my DraftKings history is so good i deleted the app <laughs> gotcha that's great uh and so are other mercersburg people listening to, to your podcast because I feel like it's an another social media opportunity for us to get together. As you pointed out at the beginning of the show, right? Yeah. Social media is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but every once in a while you'll find a silver lining. Um, here, uh, it would be great if other uh, Mercersburg uh, students listened to this and, and helped us, you know, uh, I communicate and get together and stay in touch. I agree. I mean, one thing you can do for me is, is like the show on podcast apps, share it with additional people. Nobody seemed to join the live audience here today, but later today it's going to go out to the masses. And, you know, we're on Spotify, iHeart, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, name a podcast app and, and we're on it. And so I'll continue to do the best I can with social media and promoting the show. And, hey, I would appreciate it if you drop a pebble out there on the East Coast too. It helps. Now, what I would really like to know, here's what's interesting, John. You get a kick out of this. When I look over my statistics of the show, I have two people in Finland, four people in Haiti that are listening to the show. So we're, we're making you know, a difference, kind of in a, um, uh, it's a, a pincer attack. I'm coming from that way 
around the United States, I think, and will just continue to grow. All right. Well, God bless. Listen, um, uh, this was a lot of fun. Let's do this again. I also, I want to, I will listen, especially if you get other Mercersburg alumni to, to talk to you. I want to hear that. I want to hear what they're doing. Uh, get them it's a really nice opportunity yeah, to, to peek into others' lives and, and how we've grown and what we've done since, since high school. I think it is. And now that you've blazed the trail, maybe we can find some of them. We'll pull them out of the woodwork. We'll see what they've been up to. Again, I appreciate it, John, making the time for me. I know you've got to go. I'm going to talk to you offline or we'll work out a way for me to get you some paddles. And then there'll be an extra one. Stick it in the shop. Let famous people come in and sign it. You can just make that a thing. That'd be neat. It'd be for you. That'd be cool. <laughs> we'll make it happen. Uh, I'm happy to take point, Mikkel. Absolute pleasure. Have a great day. I got to get back to work. But, but sincerely, this, was, uh, this positively made my morning. Hey, you have a great day, John. I appreciate you, and we'll talk again soon. All right, brother. You got it.